are we ready for some Pac-Man? Um, <laughs> you're supposed to do, uh, Okay, um, yeah, so reinforce reinforcement learning with Pac-Man. Today, we are gonna start out by talking a little bit about reinforcement learning. We're gonna t introduce some terminology and we're gonna do some examples. Uh, then we're gonna continue on to Q-learning and do some examples from there as well. And then we're going to do a demo of Q-Learning and Pac-Man. Um, then we're going to continue over to deep Q-Learning and uh, finish off with some uh, demo of deep Q-Learning with the Pac-Man agent. Uh, yes, so reinforcement learning. Uh, in the last years, re reinforcement learning has uh, really become uh, more and more hyped because of the results it has achieved. Uh, so such as this one from 2013, which is um, DeepMind who made an agent that plays Atari games and it uh, performed uh, with the superhuman performance on uh, several games. Um, they also made AlphaZero, which uh, plays chess, shogi and go and also beat the world's best players in those games. And then uh, uh, OpenAI made OpenAI 5, which, which are uh, Dota bots, and only two weeks ago they beat OG, which is the current uh, world champion of uh, Dota 2. Uh, and then DeepMind made StarCraft 2, or an, uh, an agent that plays StarCraft 2. And I don't know if he beat the world's best players, but they beat really good players at least. Um, so reinforcement learning is used a lot in games because they have some challenging environments. But the idea is to use the games as a stepping stone before going into real world applications. So, and they're also used in real world applications today, such as in self-driving cars, recommendation systems, in chemistry and medicine and, and so on. Uh, here's an example of reinforcement learning uh, used in, um, in traffic light scheduling. So they put an agent in a complicated environment where a traffic was represented as an eight dimensional vector. Um, and it tried to maximize, maximize the number of cars that gets through all of this uh, traffic jam. And they, uh, they got some pretty good results. Uh, then I'm gonna show a video. What do you guys see now? Uh, I need to push this one. Okay. A uh, video in robotics that's also commonly used. A variety of visual generalization oh, there experiments. There is sound. Great. The insets show the camera images that are fed to the policy. The hanger policy can handle different hangers and large objects that cover part of the view. The insertion task succeeds in the presence of new objects in the background and can even insert the block when the cube is held in a person's hand. The hammer task can also be done with an arm in the scene, as can the bottle task. Here, the robot follows a moving target. The target did not move during training. When we cover the monocular camera, the robot... That's it. No more of that. Um, so we can see that reinforcement learning is also used in robotics, and it also like achieves uh, pretty good results. Let me change again. Um, so a little bit of reinforcement learning uh, theory. So we have kind of five terms that are really important to understand before you do reinforcement learning, and they're listed right here. Uh, an agent takes actions. Um, for instance, it can be a drone making a delivery, or it can be a Super Mario uh, navigating in a video game. And in real life, you yourself um, is an agent, uh, where you do, you, you perform actions and you get some reward or punishment from, from society. Uh, an action is performed by an agent where the agent has a kind of finite number of uh, possible actions and the agent chooses an action from this set. Uh, for instance, in Super Mario, he can run to the right, he can run to the left, he can jump and he can like duck down. The environment is the world where the agent moves. Uh, the environment takes the agent's current state and action as an input and returns an output of the, the agent's reward and its next state. 
Um, so if you're, the, if you're the agent in real life, the environment is like the law of physics, for instance, and the rules of society that process your actions and determines the consequences of them. Um, a state is a snapshot of the environment, and it is a concrete and immediate situation in which the agent finds itself. Um, for example, it's a specific place and moment where the agent is put into relation to other significant things, such as uh, tools, rewards, enemies, and so on. You can think about it as stopping time at any given point, and then you find yourself in a, in a state. And all possible states then makes up the whole environment. Uh, the reward is a feedback by which we measure the success or failure of an agent's actions. Uh, for instance, in a video game, when Mario touches a, uh, a coin, he gets some uh, points, right? And um, here's how reinforcement learning works on the most uh, basic level. If we start at the vertical stripe line down to the left here, we can see that we have a, a state and a reward, which is the input to the agent. And based on this, the agent then uh, performs an action in the environment. An environment returns the next state and the reward for that action that the agent performs. And then it continues like this in a loop until, until it stops. Um, let's look at a Super Mario state. So in Super Mario, the whole environment is, uh, is the whole game, right? It's all possible states that the Super Mario can be in. The agent is Super Mario itself. The possible actions he can do, uh, in the start at least, is run left, run uh, right, jump, and uh, duck down. And then he can shoot fireballs and something else, but we're not going to talk about that. Um, uh, yes, so when you, so then Super Mario has to perform some kind of action. He has to choose, do you want to run left, right, down or up? And when he chooses that, he's going to get to the next state. You guys see that? Yeah, boom. He chose to go to the right. So he goes to the right. The environment then gives you the next state, and it also gives you some kind of reward. Now here, nothing really happened, so there's probably not going to be a big reward in this step. If we look at another example of this uh, of this robot here, here you have a new environment. It's the whole, whole board kind of thing here. Uh, you have the rewards down uh, at the bottom. And you have the agent, which is the robot in the bottom left corner. Um, so here again, the robot chooses to make an action. And uh, based on the, the rewards it gets, it should probably figure out that it wants to get to the exit point of this uh, maze. Yes, so there is a couple of uh, problems in reinforcement learning that you have to uh, address. Um, the first one is called the exploration versus exploitation. So let's say that the robot goes to the right the first time and it gets a reward of one, right? Because of the reward rules we have written down here. Now the next time the agent gets back to the initial state of this problem, if he just chooses to do the, the highest possible uh, rewarding move, um, he's always now gonna go to the right because up is zero, because you haven't visited yet, but right, if you go right, you get a one reward. So it's always just gonna go to the right. So there, that's why you have um, a small probability of an agent doing a random actions, a, ra a random action. So after many iterations through this, the agent is eventually gonna try to go up. And then it also sees, oh, I'm gonna get a reward of one here as well. And now I have, two equally good uh, moves on the, on the first state. Um, and it's called exploration when you try new moves and it's called exploitation when you, when you do the, the move that is considered the best based on your agent. Uh, another problem that you face when you're doing reinforcement learning is uh, future rewards. Um, so let's say that you're playing an RTS game or something. Uh, and you have, and you start the game and you're playing against an opponent. And you start the game and you have this, this building you can build. And if you build this building, it costs a lot of money up front, but it maybe generates more money uh, as time progresses, right? And let's say you build this building in the start of the game 
and then 15 minutes later you win the game because you have so much more gold than your opponent that you can just uh, and kill him, build warriors and, and kill him, right? And the agent might then think that uh, it is what happened right before you won that made you win, but in reality it is what happened at the very beginning of the game that made you win because you had so much gold. And this is also something you have to address when you're doing reinforcement run. Um, okay, so let's talk a little bit about Q-learning. Um, so Q-learning is an algorithm that learns how good an action is in a, in a given state. And this value is called a Q-value. So for each state uh, action pair, there will be a score of how good these actions are. And when the model is trained, these Q-values are a measurement of how good each action is in each game state. So when you run the algorithm, the agent simply picks the agents with the highest Q value for each state. You're doing the exploitation step. So let's look at an example here. Uh, if you have a game here where the agent is the, is the smiley face, and then you want to get to the coin. So you set up some rewards. You give, for instance, uh, okay, if you get the coin, you get 20 points. If you fall into a pit, you get minus 20 and then you introduce a move penalty as well. Because if you don't introduce a move penalty, the agent could go in a loop from state 0 to 1, 3, 2, and then back to 0 again. And then at some point it can just jump from 3 up to 5 and grab the coin and it can get the maximum amount of points. But you want the agent to go to the coin as fast as possible. Uh, so you, inc you, you introduce a move penalty, so it's just going to go straight to the to the coin. Um, after re the rewards are defined, uh, you s initialize your Q table, which is where you're going to store all your memory of your um, agent. And it's going to the Q table is a dictionary where each uh, key to the dictionary it is each uh, possible state. So here we have six possible states, it's 0 to 5, and each of these uh, states are then going to be keys to this dictionary. Then each state has a uh, new dictionary, which are all, all the actions that are possible in each state. So it's kind of a nested dictionary. And the value of each, each action is the, is the Q value. We're going to look at an example soon. We just have to, first we have to introduce the update formula for Q learning. Um, uh, it's this one. So you have you have the Q value to a state T and an action T. Um, the way you calculate this is that you take the old value that you have calculated earlier, or if you initialized it, then it's a zero. Then you uh, take a uh, parameter called the learning rate, and you multiply this by a uh, um, yeah, by the reward which you get from the environment, plus a discount factor times the maximum Q value from the next state that is possible. And then you subtract the old value to uh, uh, or normalize a little bit. Um, yeah, we're going to look at an example right now. Um, so let's say you have chosen a learning rate of 0.2 and a discount factor of 0.9. These are just like the normal go-to values. And you have your... Um, smiley face down to the left in the state zero. And let's say you want, you chose a random action, you either go to two or you can go to one, and you chose to go to two. So then you plug in all these numbers in the equation, and uh, you can see that since you got a reward, you get a reward of minus one, but since your learning rate is 0.2, you have to take 0.2 times the minus one, and everything else is zero at this point. Um, so you get a minus 0.2 Q value. And then you can update your uh, dictionary accordingly. So here you can see that um, in state 0, if you pick action 2, the Q, Q value of that is minus 0.2. And then <coughs> you continue with this. And let's say you want to choose a random action again because you don't know anything, you just started. So you go to... Uh, state 4, for instance, or, or tile 4. And you plug these values in again, and this time you get a minus 4 Q value. And you update uh, accordingly. Now, 
state four is a terminal state, and when you and when you uh, enter a terminal state, you start the execution over again. And uh, with this, but with this time, it's uh, you have a some Q values that you can use from. So if if the um, agent now does some exploitation, it's going to go to state one, right? Because state one has a zero value, whilst if you go to tile two, it has a minus 0.2. Or it can explore as well, and then it's just going to be random. And after a while, this kind of converges, hopefully, if you have implemented the update rule, uh, update rule correctly, <laughs> uh, it's going to converge, and you're going to have a pretty accurate uh, picture of, of, of this environment. And uh, the smiley face is going to move up to the, to the coin. Uh, so let's see how it is implemented in uh, in Python here. Here you can see. Is this one maybe? No. Okay. Uh, can everyone see this? Uh, how do I zoom in? That is the question. <laughs> Command. Oh, yeah. That is correct. Okay, cool. Can everyone see better now? Yeah, cool. Okay, so um, by the way, this is a workshop that uh, me and uh, Manu and Eirik Folksta made. We have held it once at NTNU. And Johannes. And Johannes. He, uh, he made the game. That is correct. Um, yeah, there's no one else I forgot there. No, okay. Uh, okay, cool. So uh, we're not going to look at any game code at all. We're just going to do the queue learning part of it. Um, so here are the rewards for each move. I just say that if it captures a dot, um, you get two. And if you b get captured by ghost, you get a minus five reward, for instance. And these are just values that you just kind of figure out as you go. Uh, nothing really, not, no empirical like evidence or, or anything is done here. I just plugged in some random numbers and tweaked them a little bit until it like kind of works. <laughs> <laughs> and then, uh, <laughs> and then you have uh, when you initialize the Q learning, you initialize the Q table, which is just an empty dictionary. Uh, here's the pick action function, which has a probability of 20% uh, to explore to just choose a random move, or it has. Uh, at, or it has an 80% chance of choosing the most optimal move. Uh, or, uh, skip these, blah, blah, blah. Okay, here's the training code. Uh, you initialize new game. Discount is uh, 0.8 here, actually, and uh, the learning rate is 0.2. And then you loop, uh, loop through each episode. Remember, one episode is like one playthrough of a game. And um, here you can see on line 91, you pick the action, even if it's uh, random or if it's the optimal one. You get the new game state, and you get an action event from, uh, from the environment. And then if you won, you just print one. And if you lost, uh, then you check if you're in a terminal state. And if you're in a terminal state, the episode is done, and you start over again. Uh, you calculate the reward based on the action event you got from the environment. And then uh, here's the update uh, rule uh, that updates the Q values in your Q table. Uh, yeah, And then this is just a loop, and you choose how many episodes you run. This is also just uh, try and failure uh, parameters. Uh, yes. So we can try. I have a pre pre-trained one, but we can train one later too. Um, okay, so when I start this one, it's not going to look like Pac-Man because this is custom made by Johannes Musquez. Uh, so the Pac-Man is going to be the agent that is in the bottom middle, and the ghost is going to be on the on the top in the middle. Just so we're, we're going to run it in multiple times, so hopefully everyone can see. I don't know how big it's going to be, but we'll, we'll, we'll find out. So here's the Pac-Man is. It's one that's dying, and 
the third one. I don't know if anyone really could see that. We're going to try again. So it's going to run around and take the coins, and when it wins, the the, the game is just going to stop. I really didn't have time to fix that. So you can see the ghost is chasing Pac-Man, and there it won. Um, yeah. And it learns just by using the Q values. Oh, here's going to the same thing is going to happen again, and it's going to take. So this is a pretty small playing field. I'll try to run it again. They're lost. When you lose, you say so you have three lives, by the way. If you can see to the <laughs> bottom right corner, you have three lives. So you don't lose before you uh, before the three lives are, are used. So it doesn't really care if it dies once, uh, as long as it do doesn't lose uh, the game. So and when it loses, you can see that they're just teleported back to the initial state. It, it's a little bit fast. And it had learned a couple of different strategies depending on how the ghost moves. I can I can see here. There it lost no, the third one. Okay. Or there it lost a life. Okay, cool. Uh, yes. Okay, so the problem with Q learning is that you have this uh, dictionary or your matrix of uh, state value actions, state action values. Um, but if all possible states, if the number of all possible states gets too big, then having it in a dictionary doesn't scale at all. Um, and therefore, you have to switch out the Q table with the neural network because it can handle much larger uh, state spaces. Uh, how it looks, it's kind of like this. It reminds you of the one I showed in the beginning a little bit. But you have the environment to the right, and then it uh, returns the state and a reward, and then you plug it into a neural network, and then a neural network will tell you which action to choose. And then you take that action and you feed it back into the environment, and then it continues. Uh, but when you use or when you introduce a neural network, you have to do a couple of uh, changes. So the input to a neural network has to be only numbers. Um, so we have to somehow map the state to a vector with numbers. The other change is that you have to introduce, uh, or you don't have to, but you should introduce experience replay, which I'm going to talk about a little bit later. Um, so how you map it from uh, a state two numbers is that we use one hot encoding so which is used when you have like categorical um, uh, features in your data so let's say for instance here if we have um, you have three colors you have red green and blue right and how do you put these into an, uh, a neural network you can simply just say that red is one you can say like gr green is two and then blue is three but what you're telling the neural network then is that since we know three is bigger than one, right? Everyone here can agree, agree on that. So when you plug it in like this, you're telling the neural network that blue is bigger than red, which doesn't really make any sense, right? That's not what you want to tell it. So what you do instead is that you use one hot encoding. So you give, um, you give a vector uh, representation of each category. So red is going to become one, zero, zero. Blue is going to become zero one zero and green is going to become zero zero one so instead of a number they're now represented as vectors and you, you can see at the this is a text representation of the state down to the left here the the map you just saw where the percentage signs are the walls the g is the ghost the p is pac-man and the the dots are the the coins and we do exactly the same as here as with the red green and blue examples that we um, we just check we go through each uh, tile of the state and then we just have this super long vector that gets created so instead of a state like uh, like text here we just get a 
long sequence of 0, 0, 0, 1, 0, 1, 0, 0, 0, 1, and so on. And this you can feed to the neural network. So one thing you can note then is that the size of the neural network input layer then depends on the size of your map, right? Because we're looping over the, the state. So let's say that the map is a 10 by 10 uh, state and each character get encoded to a 100 vector of size five, then you have an input layer size of 500, right? So it's gonna change depending on how big the state for the, the Pac-Man game is. And the way you train it, it's gonna be something like this. So you have a state, and then you pick the action, then you get the next game state and reward, just like usual. Um, from the environment, and then you convert the state to numerical values, which you just did earlier with one hot encoding, which you're gonna get a long string of, of numbers, a long sequence of numbers. Uh, and then you're gonna plug this into the neural network, which is just a black box for this demo here. And the target is then gonna be a kind of a, a simplified, uh, uh, a simplified, uh, a function derived from um, uh, from the update value of Q learning, um, which you can see here. Uh, it's a reward plus uh, the discount factor and then the max of the next state. Um, and when you're doing, when you're done training, what you do when you do inference is that you simply have the state, you convert it to values, you plug it into the uh, neural network, and then it's gonna give out an input, uh, give out a uh, uh, an output um, of all the val Q values of each action. So it's gonna, the highest value here is gonna be the best action that you can perform with your agent. Yes, and then lastly, there's experience replay. Um, so in Q learning, when you just, uh, when your agent just plays the game, you simply just um, train it on a tuple of uh, state action and the reward and the next state. Um, but what we do here instead is that we save it, save this to, to the memory and then we train on random, random samples from it. So you train and then it's gonna be uh, saved to some other memory and then we draw random samples from this. Uh, the reason for this is that uh, neural networks, like when you, for when you uh, run your Pac-Man or your agent, it's gonna start like uh, increasing its performance, right? So it's gonna kind of forget how it does the early part of the game and it's gonna get better at the late part of the game. So at some point it's not gonna be able to beat the early part of the game and it's gonna like train on that again, right? And it's just gonna kind of not converge to anything nicely. Um, so by drawing random samples from a memory, you're gonna kind of distribute this. So it always trains a little bit on the early, it's gonna train a little bit on the later game, and it's gonna like train all on the whole, uh, yeah, whole uh, state space. Um, it's also good because neural networks kind of need to th see things multiple times. And when you have this memory, you just draw a random sample from it, the same samples are gonna get drawn and you're gonna train multiple times on it. So it increases the performance a little bit. Uh, yes, so let's see on deep Q learning. So I trained this for 25 hours and 55 minutes, uh, two or three days ago. What am I doing? I'm doing this again. So if you wanna do with bigger, uh, bigger maps, um, you have to use neural networks because if you just use the um, the dictionary, you um, you won't be able to converge to anything. So here you can see again, these are almost the same rewards as I had last time. Uh, a little bit different, I don't remember why. I think they work better, I guess. Um, I didn't test this a lot. I only had one run, I only had one chance to, cha to train this agent. So you can see out here to the left, can you see that barely? I trained for 5,000 episodes and I saved it every 500 uh, 
episode. So here you can kind of see the progress the Pac-Man did when you train. So we're going to run a couple of them. I haven't. I only looked at uh, the final one, which worked pretty well. And then you have the state to input conversion here, and the exploration. Oh, <coughs> so the exploration here is not uh, a set number anymore because in the start you probably want to explore a little bit more, and then after you have trained for a while, you want to exploit a little bit more. So you start with a high, high probability of expo exploring, and then you end up with a high probability of exploiting. Uh, yes. Uh, the neural network I only trained. This is just um, uh, using Keras, if anyone has, has used that. Um, yeah, I only trained it on this architecture. There's probably a lot better architectures out there. Um, I haven't tried it at all. It's uh, it's a two layer, oh, there's two hidden layers, uh, each with size 512 neurons. And then the output layer is the number of actions, right? So there's uh, four actions in each state here. You can go uh, left, right, up, down. And if you bump into a wall, just nothing happens. Um, yes. Okay, and it's uh, very similar to to the Q learning. You choose an action, you get the next game state and a reward from the environment, and you check if you're in a terminal state. If you are, you start over. Um, here's the experience replay. So after you have you perform the move, then you add this experience to memory, and then you just draw a random sample from the experience replay. And uh, we're just gonna skip this. And then you train it on this, uh, you train it on the new uh, experience that you drew from the memory. Uh, yes, let me just run it. And uh, let's try to run it. So this is the, this is the one I've tried before. I'm gonna run that first because I know it kind of works at least. Mm -hmm. <laughs> uh, so you can see a lot, a bigger map with two ghosts, and it's gonna play. And when it hits those, uh, I don't know what they are. Mushrooms. The mushrooms, okay. Then the ghosts get scary, and Pac-Man can eat the ghosts, and then he gets rewarded for that. Uh, so we're just gonna run around, and something I noted is that it's gonna kind of pick up the mushrooms in nice intervals so that the ghosts are scared the, the longest amount of time, right? Because if he, put, he picks up all the mushrooms in one go, um, they're just gonna get scared for a small amount of time, right? But it, I think it has kind of learned to pick them up just as you go so that they, the ghosts get scared. Yeah. So it's gonna run instead of taking those three coins there, it's gonna run to the next mushroom so that the ghost continues to be scared, which is a funny thing. So they're gonna get scared. Uh, <laughs> they've been scared practically the whole time Pac-Man has played this game. Yes, Mame. Is it because you, you probably have a higher reward? Yeah. For the yeah, I have a higher reward for mushrooms and there is a higher reward for uh, catching the ghosts when they're scared. So yeah, it is, it is a combination of those two. So this is after uh, 4,500 episodes. So the Pac-Man has played 4,500 games. It has either won or lost them. And uh, yeah, so you can see it's gonna, it usually dies one time. There it died. But I think it is because it gets uh, teleported closer to the missing coins than if you just had to walk there by himself. <laughs> that is possible, or else he's just uh, doesn't care about dying once, I guess. But uh, yeah, so you can see when there's, there's all usually like some coins missing on the right side of the board. And then he runs to the left. 
and at some point on the left side, he usually dies once. So he gets teleported back to the coins that are on the right side. But he also doesn't have any more mushrooms to pick up. So here he dies and then he just <laughs> runs. <laughs> so I don't know if he dies on purpose, <laughs> but it may look like it. <laughs> uh, cool. Okay, let's try to see like earlier in the training. I haven't tested these at all. Let's see after 500 iterations or episodes. Uh, let's see. So this is early on in the training. <laughs> I have no clue what's going to happen. Maybe it works perfectly now as well. Then I will be disappointed, but oh well. <laughs> no! <laughs> <Pretty good. laughs> okay, well, I didn't need to run it for <laughs> 25 hours then, I guess. <laughs> Why didn't it kill the ghost? What is this? Okay, kill it. Okay, that uh, has some problems. <laughs> Move! Yeah, no mushrooms. Doesn't want to play if it doesn't have food. <laughs> <laughs> oh, it died. Yeah. Oh, you lost. Oh, that's pretty cool. Okay, nice. Let's see a little bit longer. Let's say 2,500. Yeah, maybe. I think so too, because you don't want it to die, right? You want it to just try to uh, not die even once. So if you make the punishment for dying greater, then maybe it it, it won't die. Yeah. I think uh, also a problem is there's there's a little bit too many mushrooms in this map. <laughs> I don't know. The ghosts are just kind of running randomly away. Oh. Oh, I can't figure it out. Oh! But it has one on the left. <laughs> oh, it has one coin. What to do? What to do? <laughs> Surrounder. Uh oh. Oh, it runs out. Oh. Oh. Oh, <laughs> oh I won. Nice. Okay. Well, yeah, as you can see, it, it's, uh, you can't really win in the start and then it gets better and better as you, as you train. Yeah, so that's pretty cool, I guess. Uh, yeah, I think that's it for that. Um, and then improvements for this. There's a ton of improvements. Uh, I trained this once using just random parameters on the neural network, for instance. It's you can just type in other parameters, and maybe it's going to be better or worse. Who knows? Uh, one thing you can do, though, is using convolutional layers. So this is just a normal feed-fork neural network. But what convolutional layers can give you is that they have kind of a, they perform really well in two dimensions. So when you see neural networks uh, in, in images or pictures, it always, always, almost always at least, uses uh, convolutional layers. Uh, of course, more training time would be nice, more memory, more processing power. I don't think that's the case on, on such small maps that we saw now, really, maybe, because I got it kind of working a little bit. I think more tuning of uh, parameters and stuff will, will improve more. Um, there's also a thing you can do. Uh, whoops. Haven't seen this one? Well, now you can see it. Uh, I'm on the third point down here now. Um, <laughs> you can also add an additional neural network, which then stabilizes training a little bit more. And maybe you can get the same results with uh, half the episodes that I've done. Instead of 5,000 episodes, you can maybe get the same results in 2,500. Um, and then there's something called prioritized experience replay. So what I do is I draw replays or experiences randomly from the memory, right? But you can you can somehow give, give these experiences some priorities and be like, I want a higher percentage of the time get these experiences because they're, they're more valuable right now or, or something like that, right? Uh, yeah, and then a lot of parameter optimization. Uh, the rewards can be better, I'm sure. The neural network can be better, and yeah, all of these parameters are just pretty random right now. Yes. Okay, so that is uh, it for me. So have a. <laughs>